All right, somebody ring that bell over there. Well, God bless you guys. Wonderful to see you um, as everybody's getting their seats. Uh, I do want to add on to what Mike was saying there. You know, this is going to be a big push for us in the coming year. It's really kind of turning into the vision for the next year is just really reaching out. Uh, we've been kind of self-focused a little bit um, in not, you know, supporting missionaries and doing other things because of the, the cost of this building. But as we are growing and as we're uh, just kind of progressing along, you know, we're, we're really starting to look outwardly, uh, looking at supporting some missionaries and, uh, you know, just really making an effort to uh, bring in the unchurched, as Mike was saying. And so uh, there is definitely this, you know, people going from church to church. There's a lot of great churches here in Colorado Springs, and, and there is definitely a migration among Christian churches. There always has been, I would, I would imagine, to some degree of uh, people getting frustrated or just not getting fed or for whatever reason, uh, leaving one church and going to another. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but certainly the Great Commission tells us to go out and tell those people who have never heard or have never accepted about Jesus. And so that is definitely becoming a major focus for us here in this church. So continue to pray about that. Well, today, uh, it's almost a sad thing for me to say that we're going to end the book of Philippians. I don't know about you, but I have just thoroughly enjoyed studying and teaching the book of Philippians, and uh, I hope you have as well, but uh, we'll wrap up the book of Philippians here today with chapter 4, verse 10 through 23, and lovely Kelly is going to come up and read that for us. So go ahead and stand in reverence to the reading of God's word as we, as we read the passage here today. Thank you, Kelly. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you for this encouragement to us, Lord, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Father, we ask that uh, as Paul found this secret of being able to be content, Lord, that each of us would also be able to mature to that place where we could be content in any situation, whether we're in need or whether we're abounding. Father, we know that that's your heart and your will for us, and so we ask that you'd help us to achieve it in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and have a seat, amen. Well, I've entitled the message today, You Can Do It. You Can Do It. 
I want to just encourage you today as we wrap up the book of Philippians, uh, you know, we can teach this as, uh, you know, just kind of, well, this is what Paul did, and this is how Paul came to the end of his life, but I want to tell you, you can do it as well. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. This is a very personal verse for me. Uh, at one point in my life, I was, a, I was never a heavy smoker, but I was kind of a social smoker, but still hooked just enough to where I couldn't quit, you know, in certain situations. Uh, out on a ship in the Navy, obviously, is uh, one, of those, one of those times I really had a hard time. I mean, as soon as that ship pulled out to sea. I had to have a cigarette in my hand a lot of times. And over the course of years, I really got to a place where I couldn't quit. And I I grabbed a hold of this verse one day. I was reading it and and just studying it and going through this book in my devotional reading. And and I came to that, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And I said, yes, I can. And I quit smoking. Now I started smoking again a couple of years later socially again. But I did. I quit that time and eventually obviously quit. But, um, you know, that's the encouragement I want you guys to have a sense of here today, that you can do it. You can be content. And that's a a very different message than what you hear in the Christian church in the last 40 years, isn't it? Uh, The Christian church for the last 40 years in many precincts has taught this Uh, you know, blab it and grab it. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to be satisfied. God wants you to be in a luxurious lifestyle. And, and if you're not in that, you're in some kind of sin. You've got something wrong going on in your life. But Paul says something very different here. No, you need to learn to be content. Sometimes you're going to have need and you need to learn how to act and learn how to be content in that situation where you have need, where you have hunger. But sometimes you are going to be blessed. Sometimes you are going to have a situation where God's just really pouring into your life and and you're in a position of prosperity maybe. And then how do you act in that situation? Are you prideful or do you deal with it? And so that's what we're looking at here today. I think there's some great truths that we can glean from this here today. Uh, I read this story about a man who was just laying next to his fishing pole there by the shore, sleeping, and uh, a very wealthy entrepreneur kind of guy came along, you know, one of these real type A personality kind of guys, and he kind of kicks the guy, he's like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'll just take a little nap here. Well, why aren't you fishing? Oh, I've caught all the fish I needed today. Well, why don't you catch more than what you need? Well, why would I want to do that? Well, then you could, you know, buy a boat and then go out deeper into the water and and catch even more fish. Well, why would I want to do that? Well, you can have a fleet of ships and you can become very wealthy like I am. And the guy said, well, why would I want to do that? He said, well, you can just be able to relax and enjoy your life. And the guy said, well, what do you think I was doing until you came along? (laughs) I was relaxing. I was content. And, and, you know, that's a, that's a funny story, but, you know, that happens in the world, doesn't it? We have this tug to be successful. And if we're not in that place of being successful, then we have to wonder, well, what's wrong with me? Am I not being blessed by the Lord? Or, you know, I have to be wealthy. I have to have lots of money and, and have all kinds of things in my life or I'm not successful. But that is just absolutely not the truth. And so what we see here today clearly in this passage is contentment. If you're content in your wealth, then great. If you're content in your poverty, then that's okay as well. And Paul uh, very clearly tells us that here in this passage in verse 11. He said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I know how to do those things. I've learned those things. I've learned the secret. And, you know, I I just can't overemphasize enough as we've talked, as we've gone through the whole book of Philippians, to be able to come to that place in your Christian walk. Boy, that's a good place to be. That is a good place to be. I am satisfied no matter what is going on in my life because I have this relationship with Jesus Christ. And I realize through the depth of that relationship that there's nothing I really truly need. I have everything that I need because Jesus gives me everything that I need. Amen? Amen. Old Benjamin Franklin said, content makes poor men rich and discontent makes rich men poor. 
Boy, I thought that was a great, great quote. If you're content, you're a rich person. If you're content, but discontent, you know, it doesn't matter how much wealth you have. You're going to be miserable if you can't find that secret of contentment. But that secret doesn't come from having lots of stuff. It doesn't come from having lots of success in your life. As we see so often, people who become fabulously wealthy and at the height of their, you know, uh, apparent wealth and success, they commit suicide or, you know, just have a divorce or something terrible going on within their lives. And we see that in the news all the time. Content makes poor men rich. I want to uh, look at a couple of verses here that you see this uh, taught throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament. This concept of contentment comes to us many times through uh, Paul often. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now again, does that sound like 21st century Christianity to you? Hey, don't seek after great gain. Don't seek after all these things. Don't seek to be rich. If you seek to be rich, if you seek after those things, you're going to be drug into a snare. It's going to be a a bad thing in your life, not a good thing. But contentment and godliness at the same time, well, that's great gain right there. If you can come to that place in your life, you will truly be a rich person. Now, again, I want to put this in the terms today of encouragement for you as we wrap up Philippians. Now we can say, and I can encourage you to be content. You can be content. That's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says to you. Be content. And so I could encourage you just to be content. But I don't want to just do that. I want to encourage you of the fact that you can be content. It's not just an empty thing that we throw out there. It's not just a, a you know, a saying that we say to people in the church. Be content with what you have. My wife was showing me a a Facebook page of some friends of ours that we used to be in the Navy with out in Virginia many, many years ago. And we had a home fellowship that they would come to our house every Friday night for about five years. And a bunch of us were really good friends when we were younger. And and, uh, she showed me this post of the fact that they were over in Hawaii on vacation. And, and we've known for a little while, he, he's gotten a fairly good job after he got out of the military. He was a nuclear engineer and, and just a real smart guy. And, and so they're on vacation over in uh, Hawaii, you know, and it's like, mm. <laughs> you know, mm, that'd be nice. Of course, my wife, I can't get her to go to Hawaii. She doesn't want to go to Hawaii, but I'd love to go back to Hawaii and see it again. But it it just spoke to me as I was kind of preparing the lesson here this morning and just kind of going over it again contentment. It's okay. You don't have to, you know, hey, praise the Lord for them. Praise the Lord. They're out in Hawaii having a great time. I don't have to be jealous of that. I don't have to be envious of that. I don't have to covet after what their blessings are. I can be content in where I am and where the Lord has me. And so can you. You can do it. You can be content. Paul did it and many others in the Bible found that secret to life of being content and where God has them. Someone once said, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you. Encourage me and I will not forget you. And I found that to be true in my life. You know, people that encourage you, and I'm sure you have as well. When people encourage you, it really floats you. And it's not just flattery. It's not just flattery, and that's not what Paul is doing here in this passage at all. He's saying you can do all things, not because of you, not because of how great you are, but because of Christ who strengthens you and gives you the ability to do those things. And that's the the key here for us today. There's an old farmer who was, let me grab my glasses here before I step on them. Old farmer who was out shooting pheasants with his dog 
And um, a man came along and he said, you know, I've, I've never seen a pointer dog like yours actually in action. Do you mind if I tag along and just kind of see how this goes? And sure, come on along. So they're out and they're hunting and all of a sudden that dog, you know, points at a bush and the farmer shoots his gun in the air, but no birds came out. And then they just kind of walked along a little bit further. Same thing happened. That pointer dog just pointed right at that bush and the farmer shot his gun in the air and, and no birds came out. And the guy said, well, now I'm a little curious here. What's going on? Because I thought the dog was saying there are birds in that bush. And the farmer answered back, and he said, well, shucks, I, I knew there weren't no birds in there, but old Betsy's nose just ain't what it used to be, and it'd be an awful shame to start calling her a liar at this stage of the game. <laughs> he was trying to encourage his dog in her elderly state, not knowing where the birds were anymore. But is that what Paul is telling us here today? Is he giving us an empty, flattering kind of an encouragement? No. The Bible is so clear here. We can do this. We can be content. And that's an amazing thing to me. Through through Jesus Christ, we can do all things, it says. He strengthens us. He gives us the ability. That's not an empty flattery. That's not just, uh, you know, just trying to, put air under your wings. You know, there's a real truth here that we have to grab onto. I can be content in what God has for me in my life, where he has me right now. I've shared this with you guys. Um, I don't know if I've ever shared it from the pulpit, but I know I've talked about it in men's meetings and things. But, you know, when I was younger, young in the Lord, And I would read through the Bible devotionally, and I'd come to the Psalms, and I would just think, I don't get it. This is just sappy. You know, I just don't understand why it's in there. You know, I could understand the doctrinal, the the epistles, and the book of Revelation, and all the other stuff in the Bible. But when I'd read through the Psalms, and even the Proverbs, you know, you get wisdom out of there. But I'd read through the Psalms, and I'd think, this is just like, people singing the blues, you know, why do I need this? Why do I need this? But as the years went by, and uh, after you pay some dues, then you realize why you sing the blues, right? That's the old saying. (laughs) But I started thinking about the Psalms, and I said, well, David is writing most of these, or the psalmist, whoever the psalmist is, he's writing this to the Lord. But it's the Holy Spirit that's inspiring the things with, that we read within the Bible, right? And so the things that are in the Bible are actually written by the Holy Spirit through the vehicle of a human being. And so if that's true, then you also have to understand that it's God wanting us to know these things from his heart to our heart. And so I started thinking about it in those terms. And so I started looking at the Psalms and saying, okay, if this is God writing directly to me, wanting me to know these things. David's crying it out to God, but God's saying, yeah, that's what I want you to have a sense of in your own life. As David is just that example for us. And so you could look at Psalm 23, and it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And so you say, well, if that's from God to me, then what if I took those personal pronouns and just flipped them? Now it's not David saying it to God, now it's God saying it to me. And don't think I'm a heretic here. I'm not uh, promoting this and selling a new Bible or anything like that, but it's just a, a helpful way to help me understand what the scriptures are saying to me personally. And so then it might say, I am your shepherd. You shall not want I make you lie down in green pastures. I lead you beside the still waters. I restore your soul. I lead you in the paths of righteousness for my name's sake. It's very different, isn't it? When it becomes very personal to you, God speaking directly to your heart. It's not just a, an example from three, 4,000 years ago anymore. It's the God of the universe speaking directly to you 
I'm your shepherd. I'm your good shepherd. I want to lead you into these places where you can be content in your life. I want to lead you into these places where you can not have to worry and, and struggle and strive, but you can be at peace beside those still waters. And that just really meant a lot to me in my young Christian walk with the Lord. And, you know, I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I will just kind of in mentally as I'm reading it. How would the Lord say this to me? If the Lord wanted to say this to me, how would he say it? And just, again, flip those personal pronouns around a little bit. Well, how does that look for the passage that we have today? Instead of Paul coming to this place of maturity in his own life, then the Lord might say to you, you can do all things through me who strengthens you. Ooh, I like that. And then he might say in verse 19, I shall supply all your need according to my riches and glory by my son Christ Jesus. Instead of Paul saying to the Philippians, my God will supply all your needs. Okay, well, that's good. Paul's talking to some Philippians 2,000 years ago about supplying their needs. But what about God saying it to you? I will supply all your needs. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you or through me who strengthens you. And so, again, I, I just want to encourage you today, you can do it. You can do it. And so as we go back and look at these verses again briefly here, uh, first of all, we can see all things are through Christ who strengthens us. It's not us. It's not our own abilities. It's not our personality. It's not our self-will, you know, and just, I can do this, uh, because often that ends in total failure, doesn't it? I don't know if it does for you or not. It does for me. And why can we do it? Because of God's unlimited supply. There is nothing that God cannot do for you in your own life. And so begin to trust in him in that way. God will supply all of your needs through his riches. Now, again, let's look at those verses in verse 10 through 13. It says there, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you believe that here today? Do you believe that? I mean, do you really seriously believe that? Because, you know, if you did, I bet you'd want to go out and tell other people about it. I, want you, I bet you'd say, man, God has done so many amazing things in my life. When I began to trust him like this, when I began to realize that I can do all things through him because he's strengthening me and I can be content in any situation in my life and how that would change your life, and the, the ability to not have fears and anxieties. Again, remember where Paul has been talking about here in this very chapter. Back up in verse 6, you find that, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We looked at that last week, you remember. This is in the same context of what Paul is saying. Paul says, I've learned that, that I shouldn't be anxious for anything, but in everything in my life, with prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, I make my request known to God, and I don't worry about it anymore. And he takes care of my needs because he has an unlimited storehouse by which to take care of my needs. And so I know I can become content in any situation in my life, because I have that kind of faith in the God who created this entire universe, that he can take care of me. And so I'm not anxious anymore. I'm not fretting. I'm content, even in the bad places in our lives. And so that is an amazing thing. What needs do you have that you're convinced God cannot meet? Well, that's a challenging question, isn't it? What area of your life do you think, well... 
you know, I know God can provide me a new job. I know he can, you know, pr- provide a place for me to live and help me get my car fixed and, and help me at that, that, uh, that place that I work or with that friendship that's going bad. Or, you know, I know God can do those things, but, uh, you know, these, these things over here, I just, I just don't think God's going to come through on that area. I don't think God's going to show up in that area of my life. I don't think he has the ability, really. Is there an area like that? Because if there is an area like that, and I know I have tendencies to have areas like that where I just think I'm just on my own on this. You know, I just got to deal with it. God can't help me here. If there's an area like that, that's a stronghold. That's a stronghold. That's, an, that's a thing that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. It's a spiritual warfare that we need to deal with. We need to bring down that stronghold. We need to pray against that thing and not be in bondage to limit our thoughts about what God can do and what God can accomplish in my life. What needs he can and he can't meet. There's nothing that God cannot do in my life and in your life. And so whatever thing you're convinced of, break it down. Tear down that wall. Tear down that barrier of faith that it has become a stronghold in your life. You remember what Jesus said as he was talking about, you know, not worrying about what you're going to wear. He, he talked about the lilies. Look at the lilies out in the field, how God clothes them. But, uh, you know, do, you, don't you think God has more thought about you, that he's going to take care of you? He knows all the hairs on your head. So thus, they're a little fewer. But he still knows how many there are. He cares about you. And he says there in Matthew 6, 31, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. That's what those sinful, God-hating people out there believe. They're worried about those things. Don't you have more faith in the God that you serve, that he can take care of you, that he can provide for your needs? That's what the Gentiles are worried about. You're a child of God. You shouldn't be worried about those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And so sometimes we we have a need in our lives, but it's not because God can't fulfill that need. I think a lot of times he lets us go through those needs in our lives so that we can learn. We can learn how to be content in those situations. But that's the last thing we want to do, isn't it? I don't want to be content in this situation. I want to have abundance. I want to have everything I need at any moment in my life, right? I know that's me. I don't want to have a need. I don't want to go to the cupboard and open that cupboard and there's no food in there to eat. Or there's no gas in my car. Or, you, know, you know, we look down on situations like that. We think, oh, you're just, you must not be walking in faith. But it could be that God is trying to deal with you. He's trying to deal with you and teach you the secret of learning to be content in that situation. And I think we should honor those situations, those learning opportunities that we come across. And thank the Lord for them. Thank him that you're in that situation, that you can learn to be content. We want to be content like Paul, right? We'd all love to have that secret in our lives, at work in our lives, but we certainly don't want to go through the pain and the suffering that it takes to get there. That was a long, hard road for Paul. He didn't come to that, you know, the day he got knocked to the ground and and the Lord blinded his eyes. We're talking 30 years down the road here where Paul comes to this place in a prison cell. I'm satisfied. I'm content. No matter what situation I'm in, I've learned that. But I've learned it through pain and suffering. I've learned it through obedience. I've learned it through humility. I've learned it through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, convicting me of my lust for things and my coveting and all the other issues in my life. God has dealt with those areas of my life, and now I'm mature enough to handle it. Jesus goes on there, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Don't worry about tomorrow. You seek first the kingdom of God and trust that God is going to take care of your needs tomorrow. Amen? Boy, that's powerful. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's where God wants our focus to be. I just, you know, I hate to harp on this name it, claim it, prosperity doctrine, but it's, it's of the devil in many uh, contexts, you know? To get you focused on things and wealth and prosperity rather than have you focus first on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To get your eyes off of that and to get your eyes on money and wealth and that's what the Gentiles are thinking about. That's what the, the barbarians out there are thinking about. That a child of God shouldn't be thinking about those things. Think about the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. God's going to take care of you. He knows what kind of needs you have. Trust him for those needs. Well, we better get going here. (laughs) I'm going off script just a bit here. Okay. Now, we have a lot to learn, and this is kind of just what I've been talking about. We just have so much to learn in our Christian walks. We so many times, I think, well, I've kind of got to that place. I'm in a good place. I'm you know, walking with the Lord and, and I have this, but the minute something goes wrong in our lives, we're, we're back down on our face and just really struggling and having a hard time with the situation. And so I think, you know, as we learn, as we grow in our maturity in the Lord, he begins to show us these things. He begins to humble us. He begins to take away those desires that are not his desires the things that are not part of his will. They're my will. These are the things I want. This is the way I want to live my life. This is the kind of, uh, you know, lifestyle I want to have. This is the kind of car I want to drive. This is the kind of house I want to have. These are the kind of clothes I want to have. And maybe that's what God wants for you. Maybe he has a plan for you along those lines. Or maybe it's just your lust for riches, your cares, the deceit of riches, those thorns that we find that are choking out the word of God, that are choking out the will of God in your life, the lust and and all the other things. We have a lot to learn, amen? Can we just all admit that to each other, to ourselves? I have so much to learn. I don't know how to be content in, in need. I don't know how to be content in prosperity. I don't know those things, but I need to learn them. And I want to just cry to the Lord and ask him to help me learn those things. The Amplified here in verse 12 says, I know how to get along and live humbly in difficult times. And I also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing life, whether well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or being in need. And that's a great translation. I love that. That word there where it says, I've learned the secret. John MacArthur says that is a, uh, a word that the mystery religions would use to talk about being initiated as they would go through their secret handshakes and their you know, weird robes and weird temples and all those kind of things and, and have these secret incantations uh, said over them and, and they'd find out the deeper knowledge, you know the Gnostic, mystery, religious, you know, kind of things. You were initiated into those things. You were initiated into the mysteries of Gnosticism. And so Paul is borrowing from that. He's saying, I've been initiated into an understanding, into the secret of the fact that God can supply all my needs. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have been initiated into that. And that has taught me how to be content in any situation. And that is worth gold, isn't it? Content makes poor people rich. Discontent makes rich people poor. Be initiated into that with us, with Paul. All right, now, and the, the last thing here on this portion, again, you know, just to drive that nail home a little bit. You can do it. 
You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, who gives you that strength to do it. Amen? All right. Well, moving on there, uh, it has been said that a man with no shoes might complain bitterly until he meets a man with no feet. And I put that on there just to say, you know, it's all relative. It's all relative. I look at my situation and I think, wow, well, I'm really not doing that well or I'm not making enough money. I'm not going to Hawaii every year for vacation or, you know, vacationing on the Amalfi Coast in Italy. That's where I want to go, by the way, back to Italy. But, um, you know, it's all relative. I look at what other people have and I lust and I covet after what they have and I feel like I'm not content or I, I can't be content because of what other people have. But then you look in the other direction and see what other people don't have. And you see the, the horrible straits that they're in around the world. In the United States, it's very easy to, you know, just covet after the, the very wealthy and rich and look at what I have and not think it's much. But what I have compared to people overseas in, in third world countries, you know, I'm a, I'm a millionaire. I've got like four TV sets at my house, you know. I mean, it's crazy. The wealth that I have, but am I content with it? No, again, it goes back to this, this idea. Hey, if you had no feet, you'd be very, very uh, appreciative. <laughs> or if you had no shoes, you'd be very appreciative of the fact that somebody didn't have feet. They couldn't even walk. They were in a wheelchair, perhaps. So think about that. F.B. Meyer, my favorite commentary, I think I've learned and you guys have learned. Paul, <laughs> Paul had learned one of the greatest lessons, contentment with whatever state he found himself in. This is a secret that can only be acquired by our experience of life in the will of God, he says. When once the soul lives in God and finds its highest ideal in the fulfillment of his will, it becomes absolutely assured that all things which are necessary will be added. All things are possible to those who derive their daily strength from God. Paul learned that. We need to learn that. We can learn that. We can hold on to that in our own lives. Okay, now, wrapping up here, God's unlimited supply. Read with me again in verse 14. It says there, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound and am full. Having received uh, from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so he repeats a little bit about the same idea here, but what he's talking about now is this gift that they had given him in the past. Uh, ten years have gone by now since Paul has been actively working with the saints in Philippi. Uh, he's been in other places, but back then they were supplying his needs. When he was over there planning those churches on his second missionary journey over in Macedonia, this church in Philippi was saying, hey, Paul's doing this great work. Let's help support him. Is this annoying you guys that my glasses keep slipping and sliding? I'll just put them down now. <laughs> it's annoying me, I know that. But the idea there uh, that Paul was constantly receiving this blessing of support as he's going out and doing the work of the Lord, the people in Philippi were taking care of him. And Paul recognizes that. He says, hey, it's so great that you guys are now you know, supplying my need again at last. Not that you didn't want to or you didn't care about my need in the past. You just didn't have the ability to do it, but now you're doing it again, and, and I really appreciate that. And so it's amazing what he says to him here. He, you guys shared in my distress. And a, a couple of application points here that I want to make as we look at this, as we can be used as a vessel of 
pouring out God's support. God has the unlimited supply, but he needs to funnel that supply through people. And he supplies it through you and I. He's able to funnel his unlimited supply through us. And, and so we need to share in the distress of others. We need to understand when people are in need, we need to be helping. As he points out there, hey, no other church has helped me. You guys were the only ones. How would you like to be that church being recognized by Paul? We're the only church that helped that, that person in their ministry and supported that person. And again, we want to be looking at this more and more as, we, as time goes on, how we can help supply the need of missionaries and, and people that have missions work and, and doing different things around town here people that are supporting uh, missions or uh, ministry works here in our church, but also just taking care of the needs of the the saints. And I'm so blessed. I I hear about the things that go on in our church here and the people that are getting helped, not because the church is opening up the treasury and saying, okay, here's some money and throwing money out there because there's not a whole lot of that, by the way. But people are just out of the goodness of their own heart and wanting to do a good work are just taking out their own billfolds and helping people and, and meeting the needs. They're sharing in the distresses of others within the body of Christ here. And that's beautiful because uh, that doesn't always happen. That doesn't always happen. No other churches, he said, helped me, but you guys helped me. And so Paul recognizes that as a need. We need to be a, a vessel that can uh, be used by God to pour out his unlimited supply. And also seek the fruit that abounds, he says here. I don't want the gift. I want to see the fruit that comes from you being able to give. It's way more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we understand that. There's great blessing that comes upon us when we are used by the Lord to help people. You know, I've taken so many people, you know, on... on, um, you know, just say going over to somebody's house to pray for them when they're sick and things like that. I've just had people here at the church, they're working with me back on a wall or something. And I say, hey, can you go with me real quick? We need to go pray for somebody. Oh, well, I've never done that before. Uh, Sure, okay. You know, and they go with me and they're so blessed by it. They're so blessed by it. Man, I was used by God. I was used by God. This, This incredible thing, this fruit that came from my life, as I just was surrendered to be able to be used by the Lord in in a way to help somebody else, to share in the distress with somebody else. And so Paul is saying, I don't care about the gift. I don't really need it. I'm content in whatever situation I'm in, but I do care that you're blessed. I do care that uh, fruit comes in your life as a result of you helping and being used by the Lord yourself. And so we're so many times encouraged to do good works within the body and be fruitful in that way. Uh, Titus 3.14 says, Let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. And that is definitely a trap we can get into in the church, as Mike was talking this morning about us, you know, coming in here and thinking this is Christianity. This isn't. This is where we learn Christianity, and then we go out and practice it, right? And so uh, there is a real danger that we become, you know, very inwardly focused and we're not doing good works anymore. We're being unfruitful. Hey, we're coming in, we're worshiping God, we're listening to the Bible be taught and okay, I go home and that's it. That's my Christianity for the week. That's not good. That is not a good situation. I think we definitely have been guilty of kind of sliding into that a little bit. And so we need to shake that off. We need to shake that off and, and get out there and be fruitful for the Lord. You know, it's, it's this idea of uh, what's in my head and in my heart, you know, needs to be translated out into action in my life. And Peter talks about it here, 2 Peter uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. He says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance to perseverance, godliness. And then look how it changes here. Those are all kind of things that are going on in my heart, right? And in your heart, faith and virtue, knowledge in my head, self-control, perseverance. But now he says to godliness, brotherly kindness. Oh, wait a minute. Now it's changing. It's not what's going on in my heart anymore. It's not what's going on in my head. Now I'm taking that out and I'm being kind. 
And so add to these things. Be diligent to add to these things. And brotherly kindness, love, that's the ultimate expression of your faith. The ultimate expression of your faith is you're going to take the, the faith that you know about Jesus Christ and the agape love that he gave to you, and it eventually comes out in love towards others and good works towards others. If, you, if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You guys are getting quiet. I know we're almost done. Well, we got like a couple more little bullets here. Hang with me. And so this is a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. Why is it pleasing? Because I'm giving of myself. I'm putting myself on that altar. I'm becoming a living sacrifice, letting God use me and burn me up, completely consume me for the needs of others. That is a pleasing sacrifice. That's the only sacrifice that the Lord accepts from us. Well, I shouldn't say the only, but uh, definitely it's, it's one of those that is pleasing to the Lord as we lay our lives down and, and give him glory in our life. Uh, I'm going to skip this verse as far as reading it. You can go back and read that on your own, but I'll just say it's dealing with, you know, how Paul talked about uh, these gifts a lot within the churches. It wasn't just something he wanted people to give to him. He was saying, hey, the church down in Jerusalem needs help. Back in the day, you know, they sold everything and gave everything to the poor, and, and now they're hurting. And now we need to help them. We need to turn and help them. And so he would take up collections from the churches as he would travel along. And that's what he's saying in this passage here. But there's a need, and Paul would talk about this a lot to different churches. And you see him here talking about it a little bit in 2 Corinthians. Taking up that offering to give to those poor Christians that are living down in, in a very persecuted place in Jerusalem. And so we need to trust God to supply all of your needs. Do you trust him here today? Can he do it? Can he do it? That's where faith, you know, the rubber of faith meets the road, right? Can he do it? Can I trust him? Can I really, really honestly trust God to meet all of my needs? Or do I need to charge up that credit card one more time? You know, I think my wife and I, we got into some huge credit card debt early in our marriage and and it's all done with now, and thank the Lord. But it was all because we didn't trust the Lord. You know, we just, hey, we're a little short, charge it. A little short, charge it, charge it, charge it. We want that, charge it. Instead of, you know, waiting. I mean, all of the debt and all the struggles that we get in financially usually come down to what we're talking about right here today. I'm just not content. I'm not content with what I have. I want more. I want stuff. Even though I don't have the money for it, I'll charge it so I can get that stuff. And it really goes back to greed and covetousness and those things, but it, it at the core comes down to I'm just not content with what God has already given me. I'm not thankful for what he's already given me. And so I'll go out and, and charge it and go in debt so I can get what I want. And so after we trust God to supply all of his needs and he does that, then we give him the glory. Rather than talk about ourselves and how wonderful we are and how far we've come and how spiritual we are, we just give God glory. Oh, man, praise God. He has done so many wonderful things in my life, and I trust him for everything. I can be content because he gives me the strength to do all things through him. Okay, well, we're going to wrap that up here today. You can do it. Do you believe that here today? You can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you so much for these encouragements that we've read here today. Lord, and we just need the help to put them into practice. Lord, we need the, the diligence, Lord, the, uh, the motivation of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that pure motivation to just serve you and not serve ourselves. Lord, we ask that you would just make these things real to us. Father, help us to just carry them out. Lord, turn our focus from this room to the city around us and the friends that are in our lives that don't know you, the people that we come in contact with who know, don't know you. 
Help us, Lord, to have a heart for them. Lord, we know that we need to have a burden in our hearts to pray for them, to love them enough to tell them about you. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand and worship the Lord. Just in case you're wondering, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a topical stuff for a Sunday or two, but then we're going to jump right into the book of Ephesians, continuing on with the prison epistles, but also, you know, going into another book, which is Ephesians. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Bless you guys. Have a great week. And remember, God's walking with you all week. Amen.